Hello students and welcome back. Today we're going to talk about how our brain organizes information into something meaningful to us. Perceptual organization. When we talk about perceptual organization, it's first important to understand what's called gestalt. And gestalt psychology is an attempt by Germans, actually German uh, psychophysicists, to understand how we perceive our reality. And, and the laws behind it. So how do we take visual information and organize, actually any sensory information, and organize it in, from our chaotic world? Um, so it's the human mind perceptual system. So it basically means uh, the whole has a reality of its own, which is independent of its parts. Here's what I mean. When you look at this cube, this is known as the Necker cube. And if you, if you look at it, you see a cube. If you focus on the red dot, is the cube coming more towards you or is the cube sort of like going away from you? And once you see this, your brain will start flipping. Or another way of looking at it is the red dot inside or outside the cube. The answer is it's both. Um, okay, how about this? So you probably see in this image, you probably see like maybe a Dalmatian and you notice that the, its tail is wagging and it's moving. But in reality, that's not what's happening. What you're just seeing is a series of dots, but we sort of fill in the gaps, even though there, um, even though there are no like, there's no outline of the Dalmatian. So Gestalt principles. Um, there are various principles of Gestalt, um, and and so they are closure, which basically means when we're given an incomplete figure, we fill in the gap. We tend to group visually group things that are cl uh, similar looking. Um, so you would perceive this as like two parallel lines, or you would perceive it as a five or an S, depending on your, how you're looking at it. Also with proximity, when things are close together, we tend to group them together. Uh, continuity. Um, with continuity, we tend to, when something is in front of something else, we tend to uh, know that this thing continues behind it. And so some illusions work uh, this way. Um, so for, for example, the sawing in half illusion, uh, which I'm going to show you right now. So when a person is being sawed in half by a magician, obviously they're not being cut in half. And really what's happening is we see a head sticking out of a box and we see feet sticking out of a box. And we assume that that's one continuous person and not actually two individual persons. So when the, the magician saws the person in half, <clears throat> they're cutting neither person in half. And honestly, I feel like the person whose head is sticking out they have it a little easier than the person whose legs are sticking out, but who am I to say? Um, so that's one example of continuity. Other examples of Gestalt principles, we have simplicity. So we tend to uh, focus on the simplest design. So what, we, what you probably saw in this bottom left image was maybe like martini glasses or something like that. However, you could see a, a number of different um, shapes. You could see little trees or maybe you see tiny little houses. Um, spikes. There's, I mean, there's all kinds of things that you could perceive with that image, but we tend to follow, like our brain tends to find the simplest image. And the last one is the figure ground. Um, so figure ground is our ability to tell a figure which is close to us versus one that is far away. So I took this, uh, this picture when I was in DC a few years ago with my son and my wife. Now it's not that I have a freakishly large son or a freakishly small wife, um, but she's actually far away. But it, I, I've created this illusion to trick your brain into thinking that my son is holding my tiny wife uh, in his hand. And I, now that I think about it, I should have hold, ha, had him hold up another hand and it would have, like, would have looked like he was holding the Washington Monument. Oh, well. So these are some of the Gestalt principles of design. And you may notice um, this is used a lot in graphic design as well. Um, so one example is the FedEx logo. If you've ever seen that, there's like the little arrow that seems to be pointing, you know, towards the right in the logo. Or for Amazon, like it looks like a little happy face, but it's also everything from A to Z. Um, so graphic design, uh, people who do graphic design are well aware of these Gestalt principles and uh, in order to uh, sort of like trick your visual system into thinking something is neat or interesting. The pie phenomenon. So the pie phenomenon is an optical illusion where um, we perceive motion and a series of still images are blinked in rapid succession or moved in rapid succession. So we, we tend to perceive that as continuous motion. So here's one example of this. Um, so we, you probably notice that uh, you see this as like maybe a, a light 
blinking. But here's a really kind of trippy thing. So if you stare at the plus in the middle, and you stare at it and kind of let your eyes relax a little bit, you'll notice that the pink dots disappear and you just perceive one moving light. Uh, that's a pretty interesting illusion. Another example um, is if we look at my, my Zoom background today, um, you probably perceive this as um, you know rain in some sort of a cyberpunk-esque future dystopian type city, the person smoking cigarettes and watching you, uh, train going by. But really, this is just a series of flashing lights that your brain interprets as color and as motion, which is kind of cool. Ooh, also, you are, what you're seeing, like me, is not actually me. I mean, I know that it's me, but what you're seeing on your screen, whether it's your phone or your computer screen, is a series of red, blue, and green lights flashing which tells you that there's a person there that's gesticulating and talking to you about things, but I'm not actually there with you, which you're probably aware that I'm not actually there with you, but what you see on your phone or what you see on your computer is completely an illusion, um, which is kind of cool, or maybe that's trippy. I'm not really sure which one. Uh, okay, so let's get back into the pie phenomenon. So other examples of the pie phenomenon um, if you've ever seen like Christmas, you know, Christmas signs or whatever, like we perceive the reindeer is moving and Santa is waving, um, or uh, blinking lights in Las Vegas is a really good example of the pie phenomenon. Uh, or, I mean, even something is like, ooh, cool and weird is this. So the pie phenomenon is an important um, illusion because it's how animation works. Um, it's how film works. Um, so uh, it's really how anything digital works, um, and it's all based off of this illusion. Okay, uh, also constancies. So perceptual constancies. We have constancies for size, shape, and color. Uh, and basically what this means, this is harder to explain than it is to sort of just see. But basically we know that with size constancy, we know that that person doesn't have a freakishly large hand or and is, nor is he holding a freakishly large apple. We know that when things get closer to us, they appear larger and when they're farther away, they get smaller. A really simple way that you can do this is if you take your hand and you move it gradually closer to your face, you'll notice that the hand is getting larger. But you, don't, but you know that the size of the hand remains constant. It's not, it, it's just, you know, that's what constancy is. Uh, color constancy. So color constancy is knowing that, for example, this green here on this balloon and the green behind it are the same color green. It just has to do with shadow and lighting. Um, and uh, the last one is shape constancy. This one's a little bit harder to understand, but when we, for example, when we look at a door and we see a door that's closed, we notice that door is rectangular. But as the door opens and comes closer to us, it actually changes shape. It, it turns into more of a trapezoidal shape as the door is swinging out uh, and then back to rectangular. But you don't tend to see it that way. You tend to just realize, oh, door, the door is moving, basically. <laughs> so um, depth perception. So depth perception works because we have two eyes. This is known as binocular fusion or binocular messages. So binoculars, like, like looking through binoculars, are the images that both of our eyes receive together. Monocular cues um, is, are images that one eye sees together or sees on its own. Um, so if you've ever looked, you've ever focused on a point and you sort of like have blinked each of your eyes, you'll notice whatever, that whatever you're looking at tends to shift back and forth. This is because you're actually seeing what each eye sees. And our sense of depth is what our brain does. It takes those two images and it sort of like lays them on top of each other and that gives us a sense of depth. Binocular cues. So um, our eyes converge when we're looking at something. So they sort of turn inward the, the closer the object is, and they sort of turn outward the farther away an object is. So you've probably done this, like when you take, if you look at your finger and you bring your finger closer and closer to your head, your eyes will turn inward until they cross, okay? Um, retinal disparity is the variation in each of the variation of images that each of the eyes receive, which I was talking about um, previously. Um, now, the interesting thing is uh, you do have depth perception even if you only have one eye and not two. Um, 
So monocular cues, uh, another one of those is known as relative size. So when we look at these two images, or we, I'm sorry, we look at this image and you look at the, the um, I don't know, like the monster, the one that's behind it tends to look like it's uh, larger. But if you remove the background, you'll see that they're actually the same size. The background actually changes our perception of how um, far away each of these things is. Mono other monocular cues, we have uh, interposition. So when one thing is in front of another, we tend to perceive that as closer. Um, texture, when things are closer, we see more detail. So like if you've ever gotten really close to your face in a mirror, you can see all your pores and all of your blemishes and all that stuff, or all of the beautiful things that make you unique. Um, uh, but as you get further away, um, things uh, get a little hazier or fuzzier. So maybe you saw a person from a distance, you're like, oh, that person's pretty good looking. They get closer to you and you're like, oh, dang, too much texture. <laughs> okay, um, monocular cues. So linear perspective and relative clarity. So relative clarity just means things are more clear the closer they are. And when we look at a, a point far away, we t especially if it's parallel lines like a train track or, or a road or something, we tend to see, it tends to look like those lines are eventually going to converge. But if you've ever walked down train tracks, which I wouldn't recommend because, you know, not exactly the safest thing in the world, um, you, you know that those tracks never fully come together. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is all I have for you today. If you have any questions, let me know. Otherwise, have a fantastic day.